I'm joined now by Arise correspondent Laurie Lerd for more on this story. Good afternoon to you, Laurie. Now a big day in Washington with the Federal Not Reserve there. poised to cut in. Thanks, Lucas. Um, so the next slide, we've got um, Africa Ready for Action series. Um, Today's one is about why projects fail. Understanding failure enables us to better manage success. The, the second of our series is project success. What does it look like? The third is how does my organization benefit and what do I need to do next in order, in order to um, implement and make your projects and programs more successful? And the fourth one we've called, why use an abacus when you have a financial calculator? This is all about working out and finding and determining uh, what are the right tools for the job. I hope you'll join us in some of the um, other Sorry, we're having a bit of a technical glitch yet. There we go. Uh, the other of the series. So today, um, this is a rough agenda. I'm going to talk a little bit about housekeeping in a minute. Um, I'd like you to meet the presenters. I think it's important that we define what we mean by portfolio program and project management. And I'd like to just cap or recap. Why, why do we do projects in the first place? What are we setting out to achieve? Why are they important? I then would like to take a look at um, project failure. Is it a global concern? And I've got one case study, if you will, here called Crossrail. It's from the UK. From that one case study, we were able to identify what we see the five chilling facts of failure are for project programs have a, a little section on how you might want to avoid these, what you need to do. We then have a, a good segue into the second of these series, which is P3M3 and how it can help. Um, at, at the uh, end, we'll, we'll take questions and answers. Okay. Um, if we can all remain muted during the presentation, that'll make it um, easier for um, everybody to hear nice and clearly, because sometimes there's a lot of background noise. Um, as much as I'd like to see your cherry faces, uh, it consumes an awful lot of bandwidth and reduces the um, sound quality. So please keep your video turned off. Able to... Um, take uh, questions and such like and and Lucas um, is going to um, play those back at the end. We will answer them at the end if that's all right with um, everyone. Um, it'll give everybody a chance to, to hear the presentation and to be able to um, form their questions etc. Um, the presentation will be available to all those that attended um, if you want to give um, the info at hydeparksolutions.com email address um, a message, they will willingly send you out a, um, a copy of the presentation. Um, if you want it in French, please um, ask and we will get it to you in French. Um, Laura, our marketing lady, is going to um, send out a survey at the end of this to um, ask for your feedback. We would like to improve uh, the delivery of our um, web series and would very much value your feedback. But anyway, that's enough about the housekeeping. Let's, um, let's meet your presenters. So my name is Andrew Ross. Um, I'm very proud to lead the Hyde Park team of Oracle Primavera specialists and certified experts in all of the Primavera product range. I've been involved for 25 odd years in helping organizations better manage the delivery of their strategic objectives. 
you'll see a little bit soon um, how um, that translates into portfolio program and portfolio and, and project management. Um, I'd also like to introduce um, both Pierre Morel and Dalian Stridham, who will now say a few words of introduction for themselves. So Lucas, if you could unmute um, Pierre and Delian, that'd be lovely. Thank you very much, Andre, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I am Pierre Morel, um, um, experienced actual public and uh, private sector. Okay. Ooh, My is in uh, electronic and computing, but I quickly grasped the human factor of organization. So I embarked on a consultancy career and especially B3M3 and um, B3O PMO. We'll have the opportunity to talk about these during the session. So in that position, um, I'm, I'm good at relating to the needs of both the technical audiences and the business audiences. So it's a really good position to basically bring business change and business improvement. And I very much like doing this, been doing that for the last 15 years or so. So in a nutshell, that's me. Thank you, Pierre. Delian? Um, hi, yes, I am Delian Stridham. So I am the lead portfolio management consultant at Hyde Park Solutions. I have been um, doing portfolio management consulting for 15 years. I started off with um, a product um, that Oracle eventually bought and is now known as OPPM. Um, so I have been working on the product for many, many years. Um, but our, our main expertise lies in really the consulting around being able to understand the portfolio management process, um, help you define your specific requirements, and then translate that into a technical solution, whichever software you select, um, that will support your business needs. Um, so anything on portfolio management is what I will be helping with. Thank you, Dalian. Okay, so we said before that we were going to have a look at a few definitions and this slide here um, hopefully will clarify or reinforce the differences between portfolio program and project management. So portfolio management is all about choosing the right set of projects to execute. Program management is a way of bundling up those projects in order to execute the like-minded projects in an efficient and economic manner. Project management is about the individual initiatives to deliver some bit of benefit. Yeah? So at a high level, portfolio management is all about delivering your organizational objectives. Program management is a way of bundling those up to execute them in a efficient manner. Normally you bundle up like-minded stuff. So if you have a, a program to implement a new ERP system or a new portfolio program um, project management system, that might be a program of work inside a, a, a bigger uh, aspiration to do some significant organizational change. And project management, they deliver bits, if you like, of functionality or capability for the organization. One of the things I think it's pretty interesting at the moment is that portfolio management is Gartner's big buzzword for 2019-20. They've actually gone as far to start calling the PMO, which we call the Project Management Office or the Program Management Office. They're now calling that the Portfolio Management Office. So instead of running just projects or programs, Gartner is um, telling people in their organizations around to which they consult to, that it's all about managing the portfolio. It's all about managing the strategic delivery of things on time to budget, et cetera. So, so why do organizations um, embark on doing projects? 
Uh, simply put, organizations execute projects to gain some strategic advantage. Um, they, they, whether that be developing a new oil refinery, producing new biofuels, fuels, using new processes and technology, there is some strategic advantage that come out of that. It might be building infrastructure, roads, bridges, schools, utilities, power stations, mines, um, platforms in the sea to, um, to extract oil and gas. Building infrastructure, tunnels for example, using new tunneling methods uh, so that more trains per second can run down the tracks. Use new improved signaling systems. We execute projects to develop organizational capability. So new processes, new technologies, and new ways that we can develop and reskill, upskill, um, and skill our people. So perhaps an example there is implementing a project portfolio management solution to better support the new portfolio planning and business processes that you might have in your organization. No matter what it is, whether it's aimed at a strategic advantage or infrastructure or organizational capability, projects, programs, and portfolios all need to deliver benefit. That benefit must align to organizational strategy, otherwise it's probably not worth doing. So, what is success? So we need to choose the right project to deliver benefit. So when is it a benefit? Well, we define a benefit up front in our benefit strategy. We develop a benefits plan. We develop a plan on how to execute and drive that benefit. We also, if we're doing things properly, we work out how we are going to uh, stop the delivery of that project or program when the benefits are to a level that they are no longer attractive to the organization. So delivering the benefit needs to be done to the expected or agreed scope. There's no point going in and delivering 20% of the benefit by 20% of the scope on time to within budget because you're not going to deliver, you might not deliver any benefit if you do that. You need to deliver it on time, the original time, not two years late because benefit reduces over time. You need to deliver it within the original budget. Unless you're going back over and over again, and this is what portfolio management enables you to do, if you're delivering within the original budget, or you are rescoping, rebudgeting, and redefining the benefits, and therefore reevaluating your investment, i.e., do you keep on investing, or do you decide you're going to stop the investment in that road or rail system because the benefits have gone away, or do you actually keep on going, expecting a lower level of benefit? And of course, we've got to deliver, deliver to the expected level of quality. So project failure, is it, a, is it a global problem? Is it an American problem, a UK problem, an African problem? Well, let's look at a couple of these sayings here. So Booz Allen um, did a survey. Um, this is quite an old survey. This is going back to 2016. And so they said a recent assessment in the president's management agenda contends that 45 billion federal investment in IT has not produced measurable benefit. Okay, a few years ago, that's in America, maybe things are bigger in America. Um, for more than two decades, implementing IT systems successfully has proved difficult. Implementation of IT system has resulted in delay confusion and inconvenience to UK citizens 
and in many cases, poor value for money to the taxpayer. So this clearly is a, um, a UK uh, view. It's the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Commons. Um, and it was initiative on improving the delivery of government IT projects. This is more recent, yeah? So maybe it's not the UK either. Here's a global study here. Project success appears to equate to achieving an acceptable level of failure or minimizing lost benefit. It's a pretty bleak picture indeed, um, especially if you consider the KMPG um, global project management survey at the end. It kind of tells us that there is no hope. Uh, it tells us that it's a bit of doom and gloom. We, you know, we, we look at project successes delivering the least amount of loss. Um, that's hardly acceptable. So we've really got to understand why projects fail. Now, the, the interesting thing here is that um, when we were putting these slides together, we thought we were going to have to find five project failures to illustrate each of what we think are the five chilling facts of failure. Actually, it came down to just one project in the UK um, was sufficient to show the, um, a failure. And, and perhaps Crossrail, which is a mega project, um, I think it's been a mega failure. Um, and I'll tell you for why in a minute. But first of all, let's understand a little bit about this project. What was it setting out to do? As you can see from the picture at the bottom, Crossrail was a, a tunnel system which was going to stretch from Reading through until Shenfield. So Reading is in the, the west part of London um, and Shenfield is in the east part of London. A lot of the, um, the distance between those was um, in tunnels. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about it. The facts are that 15 billion cost plan for completion in December 18. It's now expected to deliver in December 20. So two years late. When did we hear it was going to be two years late? We heard in November, well, we there were first, um, little leaks of information in March 18, but we didn't hear until October, November 18 that the, this project was going to be late. Some part of the project was scheduled to be open in December 18. Why did it take so long for this to be um, made public? It's basically 26 miles of tunnel under London, in total, it was adding 10% additional capacity in journeys for commuters in London. They were using um, not only new trains, which actually were delayed by 18 months because of the new technology involved in them. They were using a whole series of new signaling technology, which actually was also delayed by 12 months. Um, the combination of delayed trains, delayed tunneling, and delayed um, new signaling meant that the testing, the tracks through new signals and processes has had to be reduced from 18 months to five months. And there are massive amounts of complication as tunnels and signals and configured while some other parts of the organization are running tests of trains running down the track. So what do we know about the costs? At the moment, if you believe the newspapers, um, Crossrail is bur burning 30 million pounds a week. Um, and the final cost to complete is 3 billion or 20% of the original budget. Currently, they're a billion over in total spend to date. So there's another year or so to go, and that's going to consume another two billion. 
the organization has had three chief executive officers in the last year. So not only is senior management changing on a regular basis, staff morale, again, this is a quote from one of the newspapers, has fallen off the cliff. And there's a massive social loss cost to all of this. The suppliers, the engineers, a lot of the workers on this, they're going to be, or their CVs are going to be tainted with a failed project. So a failed project doesn't only cost millions and delay and, and misery for commuters, there's a big social cost to it as well. And that's probably in my book, one of the biggest. So what's the impact of this particular um, project running late? Well, I'm a London commuter and it's pretty miserable traveling peak hour if you're going on the central line from East London or West London to the other side. They're extremely overcrowded. The residents of London are suffering huge noise um, pollution and massive disruption to transport on streets, vibration of their houses while they're trying to sleep at night because this is a 24 hour project. It's got a massive reputational damage to government, individuals, suppliers, etc. We've talked a little bit about the social cost in here. Um, it's significantly impacting the UK government and also Transport for London finances, as they've got to find another three billion for the two years run over. Um, there's now questions about the maintainability. Whenever you embark on an ambitious project like this with new trains and new signals and new tunneling methods, um, there's going to be a lot of questions asked about how maintainable is it? Do you have the workforce there to be able to um, continue to support it moving forward? The other thing that um, is probably one of the most significant impacts of this is that, as we know, in the construction and engineering sector, um, not many, although there are many new tools and techniques available, the uptake of these tools and techniques has been extremely slow. In fact, it's, it's deadline. It, there's been little or no improvement in efficiencies and productivity in engineering and construction for 20 or 30 years, unlike any other industry. So one of the impacts here is the stifling of innovation. Um, and, and that's going to stifle innovation on other um, organizations and government. Um, and it's going to mean there's going to be a significant tightening of the governance and approval models around projects like this. And maybe that should be the case. So that's the Crossworld project. It started by being a fantastic and exciting project. And I think it still is. It's certainly going to deliver um, the benefit from moving. Whether it'll actually deliver any of the 15 billion worth of benefit that it must have had in order to get approved, I don't know. I'd like to see some analysis on that. So from this, what do we get are the five chilling facts of failure? So I think it's pretty clear um, that if you don't have a, a proper prioritization and selection criteria, the projects that you're selecting may not be the right one. So in any portfolio management prioritization and selection process, you're probably going to have several components. Cost might be one. Bigger is not always better. Risk will be one. The higher the risk is certainly not good. Technology might be one. Is it new technology? Have we done it before? Can we deliver this? So a couple of points here that I've, I've noted down. We need to, um, so that so the uh, one of the, the first fact is that you need to make sure that you're selecting the right projects otherwise you will get 
overly ambitious projects such as cross rail going through. And I know I'm, I'm no fool, and I know that a lot of these projects get through the process because they're somebody's pet and they're probably a political um, or on a political agenda or some manifesto. Those probably aren't the right projects to be doing. Poor communication and transparency. Clearly Crossrail didn't just know, the management didn't just know that the project was failing a month before it was due to go live. Surely there was a single view of the plan, the truth. And I know that chief execs don't like to hear the truth sometimes, but actually, isn't it better to hear the truth as early as possible so you can embark on making some corrective changes? So I would um, encourage organizations to put in collaborative platforms to implement tools and technology that bubble up communication that are transparent and can encourage um, stakeholder engagement. Perhaps if Crossrail had better tools and technology, and I'm sure they had some great technology, the problem is, is that how have those been implemented? Have they been implemented in a simple and understanding way and in a way that actually enables the truth to be bubbled up to the top. The third point is poor project handling. This is all around poor project management and cost controls or contract controls. I know we all think we're great at managing projects, but there's a real discipline in understanding, one, how to create a project plan that's going to work, Two, about how to communicate that and share it around, how to um, be able to identify risks early enough to be able to share those risks across the stakeholders that are involved, to be able to manage Scope Creek, etc. So when you have an integrated project like Crossrail, you're getting the trains and signals developed in two different locations. So clearly there is a need for a very strong project program and portfolio management office to be able to collect, share, and disseminate real effective data seamlessly without the um, the uh, high level glossing over of issues that must ex exist. And I think under poor project handling, everybody gets optimistic and excited about a new project. You need to set realistic estimates of times and deadlines and realistic estimates of what is achievable with new technology. If you've never done it before, how, how do you know how long it's going to take to do? The fourth point, lack of project definition and poor design. Um, I bet you we've all had projects that we've worked on where the, um, the project hasn't been entirely clear. Um, we haven't understood the requirements to a very um, detailed level. And therefore, if we haven't understood the requirements, how do we understand the dependencies that they might have? So on our Crossrail example, we knew we were running new trains. We knew they were going on new tracks with new signals. Did anybody sit to actually work out what, where the impacts of the several um, issue areas that might be there? Did anybody start to look at the requirements for training programs and education for the special kind of engineers that were going to need to maintain these new systems after they went live? The fifth chilling fact of failure 
is a lack of consideration of organizational maturity. One of the things that we've learned in Hyde Park is that if somebody's asking for a transport to go between A and B, I'm not going to provide them with a Rolls Royce because I suspect a taxi will be just fine. So if we don't understand the organization's level of maturity, how do we manage to be able to design a solution to that? So the interesting thing about Crossrail is that a lot of the Crossrail um, organization came from other mega projects. They were therefore reasonably mature in managing mega projects. The problem was this project was significantly different in that it was new signals, as we've said before, and new trains. And there are a whole bunch of other challenges in tunneling that they were aware of, but the team had never managed, never needed to manage because they'd never faced these before. So it's really important we understand organizational maturity if we're going to build a project that can be done. Do we have people in the organization that can actually understand the problem that we've got and be able to deliver it? So, how do we avoid the challenge? First of all, um, if we design an appropriate investment prioritization and selection criteria for your, your organizational organization's maturity level, and I think the key thing here is that we need to be realistic and understands of understand the risk understand that a maturity that I sorry I've got some internet problems here understanding that we need to make sure that whatever we design is fit for your organization just because today we are designing a system that is simple and easy to use and that a selection and prioritization criteria may only be a couple of components doesn't mean you have to always use that. The other thing too is that you need to avoid the lowest cost selection criteria in projects. Big organizations typically go for the lowest cost because they think that's the best economy. It's always, in my view, a false economy to start focusing on cost and cost alone. There are other factors involved. From a, from a Hyde Park perspective, we quite regularly get knocked out of um, organizations because we are seen as being expensive or more costly than others. Well, as a point, Hyde Park typically, in most of the things we do, we get involved as the second or third partner that's got involved in implementing organizational systems. The reason that the first two fail is because they haven't provided themselves with enough time with sufficiently skilled resources to be able to deliver a successful project for a customer. The second way to avoid failure is ensure an open and honest communication um, between all stakeholders exist. Total transparency. It's really important to have one single view, and I know it says single there, but to have one single view of the plan, one single view of your data. Clearly, you have to do this using technology. There's no way that you can um, have teams of people collecting data manually You've got all kinds of um, collaboration issues and, and getting information together. And you don't want this information like the old PMO, the old project or um, program management office, 
they were collecting information 30, 60 days in arrears. That's not the information you want to make decisions today on today's performance. You need timely information. You need to be able to share the same information. We need to work collaboratively and take advantage of the collaboration that technologies that exist. We'll talk more about some of the Oracle tools later, but there are a whole bunch of fantastic collaboration technologies um, out in the marketplace today. Those make it so easy to communicate with your stakeholders, to communicate from your single data source um, across all stakeholders in your project, your program, and your portfolios. Um, I've said here, use simple technology as it helps to engage stakeholders. There's no use, it's a bit like our car example, it's, a, it's no use using the latest and greatest in technology if it's complex, clunky, difficult to use, requires high bandwidth. It doesn't work. Keep it simple to engage all stakeholders. Make it so that it's easy for stakeholders to get information. Um, in order to help us avoid poor project handling, you need to adopt recognized project pro processes. Hyde Park, as some of you will know, are the biggest um, sponsor of APM in the UK, the Association of Project Management. We do that for a reason. We do that because like the PMI, the APM are an organization that are focused on developing skills in project program and portfolio management. And that's why Hyde Park are absolutely focused on ensuring that all of our consultants are certified project management professionals. The fourth way of avoiding um, some of these failures is, um, how, so how do we avoid the lack of project def definition and poor design? Well, it's pretty simple. We need to understand projects in detail. We need to understand design. We need to understand how we are going to implement the design. It's, it seems pretty simple, but you need to do enough thinking so that you understand how you're going to um, define um, what good looks like. How do we actually manage um, the lack of consideration of organizational maturity? Um, we need to understand organizational limits. We need to be able to manage to the lowest common denominator within an organization. We Hyde Park perform um, maturity assessments for organizations. And when we go into organizations like Rolls-Royce, Jaguar Land Rover, Network Rail, these organizations um, you would like to think are very mature in their processes, etc. I can tell you that those organizations um, typically have a higher belief in their abilities than their real abilities. O organizational maturity. If you design a solution for a highly mature organization, you are going to have it fail. If you design it for a lower level of maturity, you're going to get good clean data. You're going to get a good understanding of process you're gonna get a process that works time after time, and you're probably going to avoid one of the major pitfalls in managing projects to deliver benefit. So in a nutshell, those are what we see as five ways to avoid um, the five chilling facts of failure. So, Next, I'd like to hand over to um, Pierre to tell us a little bit about how P3M3 um, can help and lead as a introduction to the session next week. 
given by Pierre. So Lucas, can you put Pierre so he can speak? Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and I believe that because I'm remote, there won't be a translation uh, in French in what I'm saying. But what I'll do is uh, summarize uh, my intervention in a minute in French at the end. Um, je disais que je ne crois pas qu'il y aura de translation française sur ce que je vais dire, mais je ferai un petit sommaire juste à la fin pour notre audience francophone. So, um, Andrew, uh, you mentioned uh, throughout the presentation the organization maturity, and um, we've heard a rather bleak story about uh, yeah, Crossrail and failing project, but the good news is it doesn't need to be like that. Um, and to put things in context, we are uh, technology implementers, and how can we help? So one aspect of helping is to go and assess the organization maturity with a level of precision that will really inform how we can best help your organization. So in terms of uh, technology, I'm putting a portfolio management tool or a project management tool. Many organizations think that once they implement the project management tool, it'd be an answer to an awful lot of issues and bring success. But in truth, it's not just sufficient. And that is where P3M3 comes in. Um, so what we propose is that to, to, to ensure success in the implementation, we propose to, um, for organization to carry out a bit of an assessment and analysis, basically, into their strengths and weaknesses before bringing out the technical solution so that it can be customized to your circumstances. As Andrew mentioned, there's very many different modules that can be implemented in different ways. So it's very important to be aware of the organization maturity um, before actually coming in with a tool. So in other words, we just need to really define the problem to apply the, the, the best possible solution. So one of these uh, diagnostic tools is P3M3, and we will talk about it over the next uh, few sessions, but just today is just to give you a little bit of a look ahead on a segue into next session. Um, so first, P3M3 stands for Portfolio, Program, and Project Management Maturity Model. Um, it's, it's an approach that looks at the entire organization, not just the processes, not just the people, but process, people, and technology. It delivers many things, but three important uh, outputs are a maturity score. So is your organization um, at um, the bottom aspect of maturity? In other words, um, aware that they need to follow a number of processes, but um, need some uh, help in implementing repeatable processes and more efficient aspects? Or is your organization already fairly mature and we need to really watch out because as Andrew mentioned, organizations very often believe that they are more mature than they truly are. And uh, one of our next session, we will uh, mention some benchmark to show the differences between um, a self-assessed maturity score and a truly independently assessed maturity score that brings out the differences so the first thing is a maturity score. The second one is um, diagnostic. So it will be very detailed on the next session. We'll go into this detail. It will cover things like risk management, benefit management, resources, all aspects that we uh, mentioned in that project failure earlier on. And the last thing is an improvement roadmap. And the key bits on that improvement roadmap very often is a portfolio or project management solution. So P3M3 um, has got three points in terms of the timing. First one is to see where are you now? So look at your strengths and weaknesses um, and look into what you do well and what you know you need to improve and how it could be improved. Then we need to put some context around this. And that context is a point two. Uh, what are the strategic priorities? What does your organization stand for? What does it need to deliver? So the key drivers, some organizations would want to be leaders in their area. Some people would just want to be better at it and um, better compared to the competition. 
some other organization may be more um, a niche aspect and, and just uh, focus on a very small segment of the market. So they, again, a lot of differences that we need to take into account. And finally, where do you want to be? Um, so look ahead two years, five years from now, where do you need to be? How is the project and portfolio management solution going to help you get there? So the, um, the P3M3 assessment, that covers all these questions methodically, and it will provide some tangible, actionable points that will address uh, all of these um, in terms of project implementation portfolio uh, solution management system. Um, it will ask questions, obviously, uh, across the whole spectrum. Uh, and these questions um, are useful for you as an organization, but these are the questions that, that your project and portfolio management solution implementer is likely to ask as well. Who is involved into running the business? Who makes the decision? How is the decision implemented? What is the level of collaboration? Um, how do you manage risk? And so on and so on. So I put it as, as I mentioned, a preemptive action. So really, really helpful um, before embarking into a new system implementation. So the next slide um, is going to, to look at what good looks like. So the next session, we will look at the more positive side of things um, and look at uh, getting organized. Um, so we will look, again, P3M3 assesses not people or even a project. It assesses the entire organization, how well you deliver change, how well um, you're working towards your strategic objective. We will look at the structures um, in its opening slide, Andrew mentioned about portfolio, program, and projects. So we will dive a little bit deeper into that area. Very importantly, as shown on this little graphic on this slide, we will need to differentiate between business as usual and change. So business as usual is run the business. And um, basically for the private sector, that will very usually be uh, make a profit and generate a decent turnover. But there may be other aspects as well, such as um, overall economic prosperity, uh, staff development, and growth generally. So there are a number of things to look at. And then change the business is the matter for portfolio and program project management. We do business as usual. We're doing okay, but we want to get better. That's where change kicks in. So we will look at the equation before, between the cost and the benefit of running the business and the cost and the benefit of implementing change and how we can continuously monitor uh, this equation and make sure that the projects and uh, the programs that we deliver um, do produce those benefits. Again, Andrew did mention about uh, having the benefit in time and as planned. And sometimes you may need to actually stop a project or at least control it somehow to ensure that the benefits as a whole for your organization are in place. So we look at being agile and in control and measuring the impact of change. So really I'm looking forward to discussing with you in the next session, the merit of P3M3 uh, before implementing a project or portfolio management tool and how it can also help your business more widely. Um, so we will look at all these aspects uh, so that your business is best placed to fulfill its uh, objective and ambition. And we will look at customizing and tailoring the approach um, so that uh, you can deliver this as no one organization is like another. Otherwise, it would be uh, a little bit too easy for, uh, for us to do this. So that's, uh, that's all for uh, next week and uh, following. So um, thank you for your attention. And uh, after a quick French summary, I'll hand you back to Andrew for questions and answers. Um, alors, je disais pour notre audience francophone, je viens juste de, de présenter euh, P3M3. Et je disais que avant de mettre en place un outil de gestion de projet ou de portfolio, il est très important de, de conduire un diagnostic P3M3 afin de comprendre euh, les points forts et faibles de, de votre organisation et de mettre en place un, un, un chemin d'amélioration sur lequel 
le, un outil de gestion de portefeuille et de projet est sûrement très important. On couvrira tout ça en détail euh, en, translation, en traduction française dans les prochaines sessions en semaine 2 et 3. Um, thank you very much then for your attention and I hand you back to Andrew for uh, questions and answers. Thank you, Pierre. Um, so, Lucas, if anybody would like to ask a question, please do. Um, and Lucas, if you can read them out, that'd be great. All right, that sounds good, Andrew. Does anybody have a question? Type them into the chat window. No questions? No questions at the moment, no. No questions at the moment. Maybe we covered it all. If somebody wants to um, ask a question later, they're more than welcome to send me a, an email or Pierre or Dalian an email. And it's just our Christian name dot um, surname. So it's andrew.ross at hydeparksolutions.com or pierre.morel or Delian Stridum, Delian.stridum at hydeparksolutions.com. If there's no questions, I will say thank you very much for listening. And uh, I look forward, forward to meeting you all again next week when we hear a little bit more about the more positive aspects of how P3M3 can help organizations such as yours and mine um, do better, I think, in delivering successful projects, programs, and therefore portfolios and organizational change. So thank you very much for your time. And um, I'll bid you a good afternoon. Thank you very much, Lucas. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.